Hello, my name is Sam. I'm a research partner at Head Security at Paradigm, and today I'm here to talk to you about the problem that we're trying to solve. Now, let's face it, security is hard. Just take it from the people working in Web2, who have a decades to solve this problem, and yet companies are still getting hacked all the time. Whether it's in May 2021, when the Colonial Pipeline was hit by a reservoir attack, even though this attack only lasted six days, it still resulted in widespread fuel shortages across the United States as people rushed to fill up not only their gas tanks, but also their milk jugs, their plastic bags, and anything else that could fit gasoline inside. Or in 2017, the ransomware Pita, which used a zero date developed by the NSA to infect hundreds of thousands of Windows machines around the world, causing over $10 billion of damages by some estimates. And of course, how could we forget in January of 2022, when Okta was hit by a third actor who managed to gain super user access into all their systems. Perhaps a little ironic given that Okta is a security company whose sole purpose is to protect the customers from hacks such like this. But given all this, maybe it's not as disappointing that Web3 is no exception. Whether it's the Viper Zero Day, which allowed several curveballs to be trained, causing over $70 million in damages. To the KyberSwap hack, which relied on a very small, very precise exploit in a tiny part of KyberSwap's code base that still allowed the hacker to drain over $40 million. And of course, we can't forget about the individual users who are getting scammed by drainer sites every day through phishing links posted on Twitter and other social media platforms. Some of these users might only lose hundreds to thousands of dollars, but some of these users lose hundreds of thousands of dollars, and sometimes even millions at a time. Collectively, these victims have lost hundreds of millions of dollars, resulting in huge profits for these drainers. This is a disaster. And it's why I decided to found the Security Alliance. The Security Alliance is made up of individuals as well as organizations, including your favorite auditors, such as Sigma Pine, Open Zeppelin, Trailer Bits, and Selec, your favorite bug bounty platforms like Immunify, HackerOne, and Bug Crowd, your favorite wallets like MetaMask and Vatim, as well as my co-presenters today, such as Chain Patrol, WalletGuard, Blockade, Blowsash, Hexagate, and Hibernators. The idea behind the Security Alliance is simple. Let's develop the common sense solutions that we need in order to solve the obvious problems facing the crypto community today. For example, I want to go back to the Viper Zero Day. This is interesting because a lot of different white hats, researchers and auditors were notified about this exploit at the same time. However, they all found out in their own ways and so not many people knew that others were working on the problem. As a result, many people ended up forging on the same problems at the same time, resulting in a lot of duplicated work. Afterwards, we eventually merged into larger and larger war rooms, where eventually everyone was collaborating together. But in the end, we all asked ourselves, what can we do in the future to make sure that this sort of inefficiency doesn't happen again? I also have a bit of a personal problem. I love helping people with security questions and security incidents. However, sometimes there's just too many things for me to respond to. And so I lose track of things, I forget to respond. And if I do remember, oftentimes I might need to refer people to another security researcher who's equally as competent, equally as capable of helping, but maybe just weren't as famous. Ideally, how, some, how much someone is able to help shouldn't be a factor of how famous they are. And so one question I had personally is, how do I make it so that more people knew about all the people out there who are able to help and can get in touch with them quickly? Finally, I want to introduce you to the Eat Security Telegram group chat. If you're not aware of what this is, it's a public group chat where anyone can join and talk about security in Ethereum. Originally, this group chat used to be a very small, exclusive club with only 50 to 100 people. This meant that if someone needed to get in touch with the protocol to report a bug, they could just say something like, hey, does anyone have a contact at some protocol? And, however, 
now that group is public and there's over 3,000 people and it's really not safe to be asked for contacts anymore because there's at least one or two black hats in the room just waiting to see what the next protocol they should target is. However, this begs the question, if heat security isn't the place to ask for security contacts anymore, then where is? To solve all these problems, we created CO911, which is a globally available, publicly accessible and free help desk that anyone can ping at any time if they need to get in touch with a very small group of trusted security researchers. The usage is really simple. You just message the, the Telegram bot, the messages go to a group that we're all in, and whatever we have the time, we'll, we'll respond to it, whether helping you resolve the issue directly or forwarding it to someone who can. There is COD1. We've helped resolve a lot of different issues, from helping people report bugs to protocols, helping projects with their war rooms, and even sometimes front running hacks ourselves. Overall, I see COD1 has been a big success. Speaking of war rooms, I wanted to share a little personal anecdote. As a white hat, I get invited to a lot of different war rooms. And most of the time, when I'm in these war rooms, I'm the person that people in that war room are looking to for advice on what to do. Now, this makes sense, and I'm not by any means blaming the developers and other participants. That war room is probably the first time in I was directly responsible for potentially recovering or losing seven to nine figures of GVL. I would also be pretty nervous and looking to someone else for guidance. However, just generally speaking, the situation isn't particularly scalable, as there's only so many white hats and so many security researchers, and not enough of them to go around if they wanted to assist in every single world. Therefore, the question I ask myself is, what can I do to make it so that everyone, not just the white hats, know how to respond in the such case of an incident? The answer to that is seal war games. And the idea is really simple. If the reason that white hats know how to respond to war rooms is because they've been in so many, then let's give people the experience they need by putting them into a simulated war room where the stakes aren't as high. A SEAL war game consists of two phases. The first phase is reconnaissance, where we, we conduct a tabletop exercise with protocol. You can think of a tabletop exercise like a security-based RPG game, where we, as the attackers, ask the protocol hypothetically, what would you do if we were to attack this system? What would you do if we were to then follow up with this action? How are you prepared to mitigate these incidents? Based on the responses, we get a good idea of where the protocol team is strong and where the protocol team is weak, and what systems are most likely to be compromised. Using this, we can then develop a simulation that targets all the weak points and tries to push the protocol team to their limits. After we've done so, it's time for the practice phase. Here, we spin up a simulated testnet, a fork is made at, or some other clone of the protocol's infrastructure where we can exploit the bike that we developed. Here, the protocol is expected to treat this situation as if it was a real incident. That means spinning up a war room, triaging the incident, resolving the bike, preparing comms, and anything else that might involve uh, that, that might be a part of the incident. After they're all done, we'll gather back and we'll get the feedback on where they can improve. Hopefully, in retrospect, the protocol team will also be able to look back and comment on where they think they could have done better. We've run war games with three protocols now, Compound, Yearn, and Ave, and we received really positive feedback from all of them. In the future, we might ought to consider making war games a bigger thing. For example, you can imagine that we might open up war games to more attackers. Attacking is something really fun, that most people don't get the chance to do legally. And so war games will present an opportunity for both interested security researchers to play on the other side of the game, as well as for med searchers to test out how well their searchers might be working. You can also imagine that for certain war games, we might be able to live stream it, treating it almost like an ease form, complete with commentators. Finally, I want to talk about something that sits near and dear to my own heart. That is to say, the differences between black hats and white hats and their systemic advantages. Of course, you've already heard that black hats only need to get lucky once, whereas white hats need to get lucky all the time. This is referring to the fact that black hats only need to find a single bug to exploit the protocol, while the white hat needs to find all bugs in order to protect it. 
However, there are some other comparisons that maybe you haven't heard or considered. Like the fact that for a black hat, if they steal 10% of TBL while burning 90%, that's unfortunate, but it's still a profit. Whereas for a white hat, if they rescue 10% of TBL and burn 90%, that's a pretty abject failure. Additionally, by definition, black hats simply don't care about things like the law and are the things I'm doing authorized, whereas, black, whereas white hats do need to consider that. All that to say, if black hats have so many advantages, why can't we give the white hats some too? And it was through this line of thinking that we developed the white hat safe harbor agreement, which is a 45-page legal document designed to give white hats the protection they need to feel comfortable in performing rescues and threatening hacks that otherwise would devastate a protocol. The way it works is simple. If a white hat attests to being a white hat and has the sufficient knowledge to perform a rescue, and also observes that an exploit is currently active, that is to say, the knowledge about the exploit is in the public domain, anyone can see it and perform the same exploit, then the protocol that executes the agreement gives white hats authorization to front run that hack, in essence, exploiting the protocol themselves, so long as they return the funds to a designated location known as the asset recovery address. For white hats, this offers a very clear set of rules that they have to operate within if they want to claim the bounty afterwards. But if they do operate within those set of rules, they're guaranteed a very strong level of protection against any civil and ideally criminal liability. For protocols, this allows them to both designate the asset recovery address ahead of time, but also their terms, which means that we can try to move away from the current model, which is to say the protocol gets hacked, undergoes a very stressful and, to be honest, not very legitimate negotiation process where they might need to make concessions, like calling the hacker a white hat, even though I think we all know that those hackers are not white hats. We actually have an RFC process ongoing for the Safe Harbor Agreement, which ends on March 14th. And so if you have more questions, if you're curious to learn more or just want to uh, submit comments, I would invite you to visit the GitHub repo on the screen, where you can do so. That's not all. While those are the three main projects we've been working on in public, we've been working a lot more in private, and I'm excited to give you a sneak peek of one of those today. This is a page you'll see if you're about to visit a phishing site that MetaMask thinks is malicious. However, you might be wondering, how exactly does MetaMask know if a website is malicious or not? The answer is this repository, ETH Phishing Detect. This repository is maintained by MetaMask, and users all around the world can submit pull requests to it to update the list of known phishing domains. Once merged, this list will be pushed out to all MetaMask users, where they'll be protected from visiting that website. However, merging pull requests is a manual process, which meant that sometimes it might take hours or even days for a phishing domain to be blocked. This is obviously leaving a lot of times for the scammers to victimize users. Over the past months, we've been working on a process to automate this, which has allowed us to merge over 9,000 pull requests into each phishing attack, merging over 10,000 URLs. In fact, we've merged so many pull requests that GitHub can no longer render the profile page for the bot, which I think is pretty cool. If you also think that's pretty cool and want to help out with this or any of the other projects that I've discussed about, or just want to help out in general, you should reach out to me on Telegram or email and we can talk more about how you can get involved with the security lights. Anyways, thanks for listening. Now I'll hand over the metaphorical mic to Nikita.